Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. This is really, it's really exciting to see so many people out here uh, learning new technical things. Early in the year, we're all ready to get the year off to a good start. It's really a, we have an exciting year ahead of us. It's a great time to be involved in data, particularly uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so my name is Mark Bidabai, I'm the leader of this group. And before I go further in my introduction, I want to introduce somebody else, and that's Ross Mystery, who's at the back of the room. All right, Ross. So we're back. Many of you would know Ross. You have read his books, and he also was working here three and a half, was it three and a half years ago? Five years ago, started here five years ago. And, and went from here to the Toronto area to set up a new uh, Microsoft Technology Center there, and now he just came back here, and he's running the Microsoft Technology Center for Silicon Valley. So welcome back, Ross. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. So uh, what's nice is I just came from minus 20 degrees Celsius, so I'm <laughs> to uh, beautiful weather. And what's interesting is Mark told me he's hosting the session, so I just wanted to come by, say hi, and see some of the familiar faces, and um, thank Mark, Mark for doing such a great job, and thank the community for the great, um, I'd say, I would say good solid community that's around business intelligence. I'm just blown away how it's grown so big in the past five years. All right, I won't take any more time. Thank, thank you, Ross. All right, I'm floating around. Yeah. Yeah. Ross and I are going to be working closely together in the organization of the uh, SQL Saturday Silicon Valley, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, after the introductions, we'll get right into the program. Uh, our speaker, Dan Vilos. And uh, you'll be able to ask questions along the way. You need to be out of this building completely out by 9 o'clock, uh, or the security guards need to uh, go on to overtime. And we don't want to do that. So these, this group, the Bay Area Microsoft BI user group, meets the first Thursday of most months. And holidays can move the date, but, but usually it's on the first Thursday. And we alternate the locations between uh, this facility and Microsoft's office in San Francisco. Now, throwing our schedule off is that Microsoft is moving their San Francisco office, and so we can't meet there in uh, January or February, and we're not having March meetings because of our, our SQL Saturday that month. So we'll have a new location uh, up in San Francisco shortly, and that's going to be at 555 California Street, which if you if you know the city, that's the EMA building. It's one, it's one of the, I think, two tallest buildings in the city. And uh, I haven't seen what the layout's going to be like yet. You don't really know what it's going to be like to have user group meetings there, but we'll have a lot more information in the next few weeks. We have sponsors uh, for this group, SolarWinds, Pyramid Analytics, Microsoft and Simon. Upcoming meetings, as I mentioned, we don't have any meetings uh, either for the BI group or for the SQL Server, San Francisco SQL Server user group, uh, January through March. Uh, in Mountain View, so Tuesday night, January 20th, we've got Ian Pascal speaking. He's uh, kind of an early pioneer in database technology and was a, uh, a peer of COD and DATE and has a lot of history on the relational, relational database theory. He likes to stir up controversy here and there. You know, he's an interesting <laughs> speaker. Uh, so that, that one's, uh, if you're interested in database technology, database fundamentals, <coughs> this will be interesting. His topic is likely to be a little different from what's described here. We haven't, we haven't finalized that yet. We are a local chapter of PASS, and uh, PASS has a business intelligence virtual chapter. They have a couple of upcoming meetings I wanted to mention. Uh, January 12th, we have Marco Russo speaking. I don't know if any of you have read his, any of his books. He's developed uh, kind of a, uh, a, a deep expertise in Power BI and has done a lot of writing and speaking about that. That should be an interesting session. And then uh, SSIS Internals and Performance, David Peter Hansen. So you can find that at uh, bi.sqlpass.org. 
Our SQL Saturday coming up, this is our fourth annual event. We, have, we rent out this entire facility for one day. It's a three day of, of uh, uh, learning. We have uh, breakfast, lunch, a reception afterward. We have six tracks uh, on different topics. So we'll have a BI track, we'll have a big data track, uh, and other specific topics. So uh, we'll open up the rooms, like there'll be a room dedicated to each of the tracks. Uh, as, I, as I think I said, uh, we had 640 people here last year. The capacity of the building is 650. So as you start getting the emails about this event, uh, I hope you'll take the time to RSVP so that you can be uh, on, the, on our list as opposed to on our waiting list. As the date approaches, we will ask for volunteers to help with a few things during the day of the meeting. Of the, of the meeting. And uh, uh, volunteers are appreciated. It's not a lot of work. It won't interfere too much with uh, your opportunity to learn at the event. So this, this could be a really uh, interesting, exciting event uh, for four panel. Yes? Surprise uh, Okay, so this is free. We, uh, if, so SQL Saturday is the largest free uh, SQL training available in the world. And uh, there are a whole series of these that take place in different locations. So it's free, we can charge for lunch, up to $10 I think it is. But we charged for lunch the year before last and it was misery. <laughs> I was at a conference, I was at the MVP Summit in Redmond the week before the event and somebody was asking, well, how am I going to know, is the food really going to be good, is it going to be good enough, is it worth the money? <laughs> and I'm answering these emails and, and I finally just said, look, sign up, click on this link right now, sign up, and if you're not satisfied with it, come see me at the event, I'll refund your money. <laughs> so, Did he come back? so what happened, they didn't ask for the refund, but I got, a, I got an email the next day. <laughs> because what happened is, we knew we had enough food for everybody, and if you, if you registered and paid, you had a ticket, and almost everybody had paid, so we stopped taking tickets. We just said we're gonna, Streamline it, not take the tickets. Everybody's going to get fed and everybody will be happy. I got the email the next day. No fair. <laughs> I could have done this for free, and you made me pay $10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a free event. There's no charge. It's going to be a great event, and I hope you'll all be able to make it. And we still get lunch? <laughs> uh, yes. So here's the other thing. They, they, so, yes. I got a little beef with pass buttons. They want it to be a free event, even if we charge for lunch. And Denise is on the board of directors for PASS, so I'm the executive committee, so she's heard this before. But I'd like to be able to just charge for the event, charge 10 bucks at the door, and then if you come, you pay, and there's no question about do you want to buy the lunch or not. But it's got to be a free event in order to meet PASS's requirements. So we're just going to raise, we're going to work a little harder to raise more sponsorship, and. And um, yes, lunch will be free. <laughs> so we try to uh, give people a chance to make announcements. Um, if you're looking for a job or you're trying to hire somebody, or I forgot to mention an event that might be of interest to the group. Um, so we'll get a chance to make announcements. I did get asked uh, to make an announcement on the behalf of one of tonight's attendees to let you know that Philips Healthcare is looking for a SQL Server DBA. It's just a, a basic uh, database administration job. If you're interested or, or if uh, you know somebody who is, there, there are a couple of uh, printouts here about who the job is <coughs> um, So that's one announcement. Who else would like to make it up? Michael? My name is Mike Mullen, and I'm currently working at Illumina, which is the largest manufacturer of the United States. I work in a division with us testing the laboratory in the city. Mike. Now I'm coming up with Mike. 18 months. I'm coming up with 18 months as a contractor and Illumina has a policy that no one who's a contractor can work more than 18 months. So my first 
Johnson is, I'm looking for an opportunity to move on and exercise my expertise. There's a secondary consideration here, and that is the agency that I'm working with won't let anyone who's been working with the company come on as a full-time employee. So consequently, Illumina is looking for a full-time employee in Microsoft PI. <coughs> if you're interested in either of those, please go see me after the meeting. It's Illumina? Illumina. I-L-L-U-M-I-N-A. That was it. Wait, what's it? Temporary. Other, other announcements? I know there's one over here. <laughs> um, hi everyone, this is uh, sorry. This is Nandini and I'm a graduate student from the State University of New York, Albany campus. And uh, I'm interested in data analytics and I'm here in the Bay Area for the first time and I'm excited and I'm seriously excited about being here and the kind of technology that goes around. So I'm looking out for any internship opportunities that are starting up anytime now or through the summer. And um, I have done my coursework in uh, uh, some subjects like uh, data mining and then anonymous pattern detection and uh, information retrieval. And some of my academic projects uh, are about analyzing social media data. I work on Twitter data. So just in case there's any opportunity, please let me know. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, other announcements? Well, if, if there are no other announcements, I'm not going to actually bother to turn up the mic because tonight's speaker has his own mic. <laughs> and we'll turn his up as needed. So tonight's speaker is Dan Bulos. Uh, many of you have heard him uh, in the past. He's a well-known expert in analytical database technology. He's been his, uh, uh, run Symmetry Corporation. Uh, they consult with Fortune 500 companies uh, to take advantage of analytical systems. Uh, he's worked on the uh, Microsoft BI uh, advisory board for, uh, I, I think for 10 years. Long time, still involved in that. And let me turn things over to, to Dan Dulles. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I'm I hope you still do that at the end of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Since it's on, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. All right, let's switch this over. By the way, I want to start off with a little uh, advertisement. I just got a Surface 3, and I think it's the greatest thing I've ever had. <laughs> and I never said that about a piece of Microsoft uh, equipment before. OK, so what are we going to talk about tonight? I'm going to talk about data modeling in the age of self-service and big data. And to be perfectly honest, I'm going to focus more on self-service, because at the end of the day, in today's world anyway, big data analytics is a self-service uh, 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 manifestation. Okay. Should it be like that? We can talk about that when we open it up to questions and discussion. So we have a couple of different things going on here. We have new problem sets. Self-service. Okay. Why do we do self-service? We do it because, well, let me rephrase it. Why is self-service so hot right now? Because IT has failed. Let's make no mistake about that. We have tried to own all of this for the last 20 years, and the users of time, they had enough, and they said, you don't understand my business, you don't understand my problem, you're not giving me the solutions I want. Now, a lot of people try to make it about the software. Oh, yeah, it's too hard to use. Except for better visualizations, there is no difference between the BI software today and the BI software 15, 20 years ago. They pivot, they drill, okay? They might do it on bigger data, they might do it a little faster, but other than new visualizations, there hasn't been an innovation in BI clients in 20 years. And data science is a growing area. Uh, you're taking big data analytics, or even little data analytics, and working on it and getting the, you know, real insights. It's kind of interesting. I, when I gave this a version of this at past, uh, one of the comments was I spent too much time in history. 
on the, the history of, of this stuff, and you know, I should take that to heart, but tough luck. When you got gray hair, you're allowed to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, back in the 90s, you know, analytics and, and early 90s, analytics and, and uh, uh, statistics were all on a hot rate. And then the downsides in the 90s, we fired all the analysts, and now they're being rehired as data scientists. Who <laughs> goes around and comes around. But the real point of this presentation is that is dimensional modeling still relevant? Okay, and we're gonna really look at that in depth on the way in your history lesson. Um, I kind of said most of this. One, one of the things I, I want to point out is the difference between self-service and data science. Uh, data science is about discovery. Okay, and, and that is its true Infants. Self service is not <coughs> as discovery oriented. That's not, it's generally not about analytics, it's about presentation. It's about you knowing some work, looking at data, and presenting it to other people. We put out packages uh, back in those days for history. You know, they used to have, you know, there was the blue book, the green book, the weekly book, the quarterly book, and you know, this is more the kind of thing. We've always had a lot of trouble doing that. In ITBI. But again, it wasn't because our software was no good. It was because the darn report changed every week, every month. And we couldn't keep up with that because no one has ever called the data warehouse agile. Okay? Um, the other thing I want to point out here is in self service BI, we tend to have an author and an audience. Okay? You know, an, an, uh, an analyst puts together a package, a set of dashboards generally, and puts it out on SharePoint. We used to call that publishing uh, reading books. That's cool. uh, and data science is really different. It's about analysis and then communicating the results of that analysis. And, and those are kind of different. It goes back to my discovery. Um, another important point, I'm going to keep harking back to yesterday. I think it's, uh, Talked about a lot, but ultimately ignored. Um, I shouldn't say that. It's not actually ignored. We actually do it, but we do it embedded in our data warehouse, in our data warehouse, rather than having a separate process. Uh, but with self-service BI, <coughs> excuse me, yesterday is absolutely correct. Okay. <coughs> but with data science, <coughs> master data is only critical to the publication of results. When I do an analysis of churn through a statistical model, I get raw data. I sample it, let me in raw data. I don't care what my product hierarchy is at that point, right? When I'm analyzing, when I'm presenting the results is when I use the master data. Um, but what that in common is they're both analytical basis. Fuzzy requirements is giving them more. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Saying that they have only fuzzy requirements is giving more than they're due. There's no requirement time. What's your spec for your new system? I want to analyze sales. Run from there. <coughs> uh, but they both have minimal IP involvement. And Again, it's another reason for growth of self-service is the use of unmanaged data. And I think unmanaged, not unstructured. Okay, unmanaged data is any data that doesn't come through the IT pipeline. We have 95, 98, 99, 99, 44, 100s percent of the data people need. It is a rare case that we have 100%, and that's where we fall down. Okay, because we don't give them an easy way to incorporate that new other piece of data they want. Okay, what are the core schemas that we're currently using? A normalized schema for transaction processing, a denormalized dimensional model for an enterprise data store, and I like using the word contextual schema for uh, a web or big data, which tends to be JSON-based. Uh, 
people use different terms here, and people use terms um, all over the map. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people say anything that comes out of Hadoop is by definition unstructured. I call it contextually structured because most records have an internal schema. Okay, some people say it's schema on read, but that's only really when it's uh, true unstructured data like documents, x-rays, where you have to go through an interpretation program first to extract the data in the unstructured part. <clears throat> we had a lot of schemas before. What was the schema before relational? Huh? Hierarchical and network. Yeah. So we have, and I'm going to come back to this. We have a progression. Before that, we were using flat files with COBOL, select, sort, and merge, right? Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to this because we keep changing. And not only changing, I mean, if you take a look, the difference between transaction processing and data warehousing is not a difference in technology. Both using relational databases, it's a difference on how we implement it. One of the drivers in, in changing the schema technology, the schema methodologies we, we do is changes in the underlying technology. Okay? And we have two new technologies that really come to the fore. Uh, one is columnar databases, and the other is in-memory databases. Many times they're used together as in the power pivot world, but they don't have to be. You know, we now have in-memory transaction processing, and excuse me, we have columnar databases that don't have to be completely in memory. And historical notes, columnar databases are not that new. They've been around since the early 90s. They just weren't economically feasible until memory got cheap. Because columnar databases work much better, or at least did in the old days, in an in-memory environment. And this really changes platform on which we're working on. From a conceptual, logical layer, not much difference between column and relational, is there? A table, a column is a table. You know, so from a conceptual point of view, but from a performance and execution point of view, there's a very, very large difference. Okay. Uh, 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 summing over a large group of data much, much faster. We buy one of the you know, most horrible performant, performant items of SQL. We do, do lightning fast lookups on the fly, aggregation, and very importantly is everyone always says massive compression. Kind of depends, right? If you have floating point numbers as your data measures, not so compressible, is it? Okay, it really has to do with cardinality of your data. If you're doing a sales table, you don't have a lot of cardinality of sales. Right? You know, it goes from one to a hundred million. That's about it. If you start playing with scientific data and have floating point numbers, it's a whole different story. In memory, you know, this is something that, that's been nipping at the edges for a long time and it's first become economically feasible. You know, for a while there, people were talking about solid state disks, which we all have now, right? And that was going to replace memory. But memory's gotten cheap enough. I mean, the whole hardware stack has gotten cheap enough that we can get a lot of what we need in memory, and particularly on the BI side. Okay? Because for any given working data set in a self-service environment, and I'm going to make a real distinction here between the self-service data set environment and an enterprise data store environment. Okay? Not that big. Well, really big compared to 15 years ago, but you know, kind of fits on your phone. Definitely fits on your deep wider portal. So it makes a big difference, these things. So let's take a look at understanding different data models. 
I'm not going to focus on you know normalized entity relationship versus conventional model. Who here thinks that if we're doing BI, it should be a dimensional model? No one does. No one knows they're dimensional. They're warehouses with a dimensional model. They all do. Third normalized. Right. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about that. Now, just by looking at these two diagrams, we can see an appeal of the dimensional model over a normalized model, right? It looks neater. It just plain looks neater. Okay? So which one of the things we're going to look at? But, yeah, okay. So as going on about, should we be denormalizing our data warehouses and data marts? And the answer is yes. How many people here know how to normalize data? Well, that's a good percentage. A passive is a really small percentage. I pose to you that you cannot denormalize data until you've normalized it from a logical point of view. You can't de something until you do it for something. That's the right word. Anyway, you get what I'm trying to say. Okay? I'm not saying you should implement it that way, but you need to think about it first that way. Okay? Now, um, at last time I gave this, I went into for a second, third normal form, and there was snore. <laughs> and then we'll do DNF. Anybody can do DNF off the top of their head? Oh, I can't. I have that cheat of notes. Uh, and there's a fourth and a fifth uh, uh, normal form also. But I do want to talk about why we did that. Okay? When the database marketplace went from network and hierarchical to relational, one of the overwhelming drivers for it was relational had a mathematical justification behind it. It could be proved, its capabilities could be proved through mathematical proofs. Okay? That was a big appeal of it. Because we could tell mathematically what problems it could solve and how it would solve them. Okay? Now, if you look at relational theory, indexes are an anathema to it. And that's supposed to have indexes. What is a relation? An unordered set of data. What does an index do? It kind of orders it. Okay? Also, one of the big reasons we moved to relational was the old ones had pointers. Pointers were hard to change. They get mixed up every so often with this data. And so we didn't have pointers. Now we made new pointers. Okay? But we normalized data so that we basically, overwhelmingly, it was for one reason. You wanted to be able to change something in one place and have it percolate through the system, which is absolutely critical in a transaction processing system, right? Yes. Now we proved that wrong. Just Amazon and Google don't do that, do they? You know, their Hadoop data structures are not normalized whatsoever. <laughs> but in the day, it was. Okay? You know, um, why do we denormalize? We'll get there in a minute. So, what is the dimensional model? This is a quote from Ralph Kimball. Ralph Kimball invented dimensional models, or at least named them. I uh, made a lot of money from it. Uh, I built two companies based on it. They both failed. He <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, had metaphor and then rhetoric. Uh, uh, but what is it? It's number one. It's interesting. He calls it a logical design technique. Not really. We physically implement it, don't we? Okay. A standard intuitive framework. Let me go back to that early picture. I'm going to re present that a couple slides. You know, it is fairly. And for high performance access, okay, what we're basically saying here is we needed a dimensional model because using relational 
technologies with SQL wasn't fast enough. It didn't work right the way it was designed to work. We had to work around problems. And that problem was we had to reduce the number of joins because joins were expensive. Now that is much less true today than it used to be. But it is still true to a large extent. So why conventional modeling? We break it down. It's understandable. And, and this was a big goal of Ross. And, and he, he comes very close here. He wanted to merge the physical modeling with the business model. He wanted to make it look very close. Okay? And, and it does a good job. I personally think multi-dimensional databases do a better job. You know, that's the thing. And I probably need to vote it down in general selections. Performant, a denormalized schema is more performant on large data than a uh, uh, normalized schema. Fewer tables being simpler. And surrogate keys became an absolutely critical component of dimensional modeling for a number of reasons. Integer keys are faster than numeric keys. Joins uh, are faster on integers than alphanumeric, so on and so forth. And you had to have certain keys to do dimensional modeling uh, with uh, splitting dimensions off in the <clears throat> Okay, I can go right over this slide, right? We all know what dimension stacks and certain keys are. But it turns out, simple doesn't stay simple very long, does it? <laughs> so we have two basic variations on a conventional model. We have the core star schema, where each dimension has its own table, and it lines up with a fact. And if I had more room and that was on one slide, I'd put it out on the four corners, and it would look just like a star. And that's where the star schema line comes from. Down below, we have a snowflake schema, which means the dimensions are broken down into their component parts and made up of multiple tables. But these are tend to be small tables that I'm joining, so therefore I don't need to um, uh, worry about the join uh, performance between, you know, for example, month and day or account and department. Now, what most users end up doing is putting it all on the table, like I call it neutron star. Okay? We can sit here and shake our heads, so that's not the way it should be done. But let's make no mistake about it. That is the easiest one to use. When you go into machine learning, you have to give it a neutron star. When you are writing an RS report, what do you give it? You give it a query that puts all this together. You don't say, point of services, here's my time dimension, here's my uh, product dimension, here's my sales tag, because it doesn't know anything about all of those things, does it? We put it all together in a flattened row set and give it to reporting services, or we give it to machine learning, or we give it to here, or we give it to there. We use neutron stars a lot. And then to my point, things never stay quite that simple. It doesn't look so much like a star once I have multiple facts, does it? Kind of a constellation of multiple stars. They got words here. But it kind of works. Uh, I've never met anybody whose data warehouse looks like star schema. They end up looking more like that transaction processing system diagram I had on earlier. Okay. Now, remember, I'm talking about self-service. I'm not talking about your enterprise data store. Start getting stuff like that. That would be easy to use, user friendly. So why do users hate it? Why is it so hard? I just want to use the data. Okay. There's a really good reason for this. It is hard. When we build a data warehouse, you know, estimating numbers here, but I'd say 80 cents on every dollar we spend 
is on the ETL process from the source to the data warehouse, and then we leave 20% of cubes, data marks, reports, and so on and so forth. Okay. It's another reason for the growth of data uh, self-service. We didn't leave enough money to actually service that. Right? Okay. It's a hard thing to collect and organize and manage all of this data. The problem is we pass this complexity on to the users. We expect them to understand database design to use their data. My nephew's dad is a normalized database. Not so good. So, you know, joint. You know, I assume everybody in this room does joint. Everything. I understand that. I know. The users don't. But it's an outer join. When do I do an outer join versus an inner join? And then there's this thing called a full outer join versus, you know, left outer join. You know, what is all this stuff? I mean, come on. It's not easy. Um, and the point I want to make here, I'm not saying it's wrong to do these things, but let's not mistake good design for easy to use. Okay. Surrogate keys. I'm learning to hate surrogate keys. Um, developers need them. Why do we need them? Faster joins, name independence, and you know, if you follow Kibble's dimensional model, you absolutely need them for slowly changing dimensions. Users who What's that weird number over here that you want me to join on? What, what, why is it there? <coughs> huh? And let's be honest about this. We end up making surrogate keys of surrogate keys. What is your employee number but a surrogate key? But no, when I went to my data warehouse, I have to make a new surrogate key. <laughs> um, a product skew for those of you that are in uh, CPG or uh, retail is a surrogate key. We made up this thing TPQ147 to identify this unique product because when we change the labeling, we give it a new skew number, don't we? Which is slowly changing dimensions. Okay, so we make surrogate keys as surrogate keys. Okay, then we get to the argument. Well, I need surrogate keys because when I buy another company, I might have two people with the employee ID of 12. <coughs> we have pretty good software. Have these people never heard of a composite key? Okay. We can take a composite key that solves that problem. Okay. I'm not saying there's no reasons for surrogate keys, but we blindly follow it where in a lot of cases we don't really need to. Again, let us not fool ourselves. This does not make anything easier to use. Slowly changing dimensions. I really hate that chapter in Ralph's book. Because every warehouse designer I meet thinks every dimension has to be a slowly changing dimension. Except time. Thank God they don't have any time slowly changing. <laughs> If you think about it, slowly changing only ever has to do with things regarding people. Nobody should ever make, well, I shouldn't say this, never, or it gets me in trouble. 99% of the time, product never needs to be changing dimension. Anybody that made, I had an argument uh, at a client, they wanted to make geopolitical boundaries slowly changing. And I go, you know, when the Koreas reunite, everybody's going to want just one Korea in their hierarchy, okay? No one's going to want to know in the past there were two, or when Yugoslavia splits up, no one cares about that, okay? But what do we want slowly to change? Things about people. I get older every year. I was a uh, sales rep for the eastern region the first four months of the year, in the eastern, in the western region for the, the eight, 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 eight. Um, so the things about people, uh, and it complicates things. There are seven different ways of doing slowly changing 
dimensions in the Kimball methodology. Which one do you use? And which one of them is easy to use? None. Okay. Half the time I put in slowly changing dimensions, I end up working it out because the users can't figure out what's going on. Okay. When I'm doing a, uh, when you're doing a sales analysis system, you don't want because when I'm a sales rep today that has Microsoft as a client, but I'm only been in this position for the last two weeks. That doesn't matter if I'm analyzing Microsoft, right? On the other hand, if I'm trying to calculate my commissions, it matters a whole lot. So slowly changing is very important when I'm doing performance management. I'm doing general analytics, not so much. So let's face the facts here. Dimensional models do not make a user friendly. We are expecting our users to be conversant in database design methodologies. And I truly think that this is one of the large reasons that uh, <coughs> self service is wrong. The other side of this coin that I, I mentioned it earlier is you don't have everything they want. You got most of it, you got a lot of it, you got all that a little bit. You know, we have to, I can hire a just use the PeopleSoft organizational rollup. <coughs> Which is fine until an executive vice president leaves and somebody else filling in for him for the seven months it takes to do the executive search. And so we need this funny new thing that combines these two business units together to give him his total. That's not in the standard hierarchy, right? So there's all these little reasons you don't generally have a lot of the data. The problem is generally not the data. The problem is generally different views of master data. Right? I want to roll things up differently. Okay. So here's our traditional architecture. This Screen should not be a surprise to anybody, right? Everybody's familiar with this. We all talk about it all. A lot of us have implemented it many, many times. But let's talk about this. What has your data warehouse been for you lately? How many enterprise data warehouses does your company have? Three over here. More than one. Last time I counted in one business unit of Microsoft, there were 17. Okay. Would you call your data warehouse agile? Responsive? Or do your users actually call it a data jail? Data goes in and never comes out. Okay. By the way, if your data is interrogated, that's absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> it just eats data. You would think it would come out the other end. Anyway, so. Uh, do you know how easy to use? You mean there are people who are allowed to touch them? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Data warehouses, this does not mean they're not good, okay? This just means they're not, what I'm trying to say here is, they're not the appropriate vehicle for self-service environments. They are a tool by IT, for IT. If I am building an application, which, you know, and this is what we would have done, right? That has a set of delivery reporting services reports, I want a data warehouse to go off of. If I'm building a system to do my regulatory reporting for a financial or healthcare company, I want a data warehouse to go after. If I'm trying to figure out my customer churn, do I really care? I'm sampling my data anyway. You know, the whole idea of data integrity and uh, uh, having everything I need 
it goes out the window when I start talking sampling. But one of the things I found is the bigger the company, the more of this is true. So is it time for a paradigm shift? Do we need to take control of the enterprise data warehouse, conventional monolith, off the way? Do we need to, you know, with, well, you know, 10 years from now when I'm talking, will I talk about dimensional modeling and people will think I'm talking the same way I talked about hierarchical and bad? <laughs> Come on! And, you know, 1990, database and IDMS ruled the world database wise. We switched lock, stock, and barrel in something like five years, industry wide. There were a lot of applications underneath the cover, but there were a lot of applications underneath the cover for we use progress uh, today. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's not as unheard of. Technology is changing. The, I mean, uh, the underlying technology we're using, we also are in a different environment. You know, is the data too big, too varied, too complex, too fast? You know, there's a large group of people that say we should be replacing the enterprise data warehouse with a data lake in the middle. I'm going to talk why I don't that's a good idea yet. Uh, I mean, but this is not absurd. The other problem is, and it has nothing to do with the technology we're using, it has nothing to do with the schemas we're using. When one builds an enterprise data warehouse, building a large organization, that means I have to service a lot of people. Well, BI is personality driven in a lot of ways. What you want is different than what you want. So I need to create something that works for everybody. So I end up taking the lowest common denominator approach. Okay? I need one product hierarchy. Well, in the real world, sales, marketing, manufacturing have very different product hierarchies of the same thing. Okay? Once I take this lowest common denominator approach, I am solving no one's problem well. And everybody uses, you know, I always said business objects is the fastest way to get data warehouse data into Excel for access. <laughs> uh, but it's true. I mean, very few people use the reports and vehicles we, we build on top of the data warehouse as the end product itself. They're going into something else, whether that's Power Pivot, or Access, or Excel, or some product that doesn't have a Microsoft symbol on it, um, which I'm not allowed to say. Um, you know, it's true. So why don't we give users what they want? Now really, so I'm going to create this new thing that I had a real, anybody here seen me pass through this? Good. I had a real bad name for it before. So tell me what you think about the new name. A subject matter source. You just go after your sales data, your inventory data, okay? No joints, no certain keys, all the things you need. It's what they want, it's how they use it. Well, what's wrong? Well, you can't be right. It's not a conventional model. Is it going to perform? How's the speed going to be? Because when we do BI, we have a tendency to want what? Analysis at the speed of thought, which was a marketing term key, uh, uh, created by Kirk Khrushchev, who's VP of Marketing for uh, Arbor Software. Early 90s. So we want that. We're going to talk about it. functionality. Well, tell me how it's different than having multiple things. Okay, now it might be sufficient when you have multiple facts. Okay, but most users can handle that on their own. Oh, they're not. Uh, and what about 
start slowly changing mentions. How am I going to do that? You know, you just put it in the columns. They're not slowly changing because you have the right attribute with the right dimension for the right record of data. But you see everyone in the user, well, I see a five in the losses in the employee dimension or the customer dimension. Well, you're using certain keys because it gets a year older every year and you've been with the customer for five years. Huh? Oh, yeah. When Dan bought something this year, he, I'm not going to say my age, but you know, when I bought it last year, I was a year younger. So, what is this thing I'm calling a subject matter source? It takes self contained. By self contained, I mean no joins. Virtual table, it does not need to be instantiated because it is a view that has all of the data required for a given subject area. And that's why I called it a subject matter source. We're all familiar with subject matter experts, right? So this should be the source for that subject matter expert. Okay? So this tends to be, and you know what, I, I have a, a, part of my business is helping ISBs. And most of the ISBs that I work with that have analytical oriented products, this is the way they help store their data. This is the only way you can do an analysis, because any stat program wants it that way, like, any machine learning program wants it this way. It's a lot easier to write reports. Uh, but it's a really wide table. Who cares? If really wide view, okay, that contains all the data. Now, you want your users to filter it. Pick the columns they want. Very few people want every one of the 300 columns. And then let them pick what years, uh, what, what records they want, what rows they want. I, you know what? Sales might have, and I have this at a client, I've got 12 years of sales history. It's a terabyte size table. Nobody wants to have all of that at once. I got a question? They're driving me out. I don't know. I was three parts, you know, I'm trying to do it, but. You have to do it? Yeah. So that's my jumbo. Hi. Hello. Uh, mic number two. One. one. Hello? Is that better? Hello. That might be too loud. That's kind of working off. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Speaking of using I wonder if I get the close. Uh, columns they want, what rows they want. So on rows, you know, I only want, you know, I have 10 years of data. I only need this year and last year. And 90% of our reports are you know, year to date this year versus year to date last year. I have to oversimplify here, but it's the first report we all do. Okay? I want to pick just data for the East Coast. I want to pick just domestic data. I want to pick just international data. Okay? So, I uh, one client we use reporting services. Mark, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And one client we use reporting services for this. Really easy to create a filter. You know, I just, you know what data set do you want? We're going to pull down a list of the columns for that data source. You know, I give them a choice of 20 columns they can filter on if they want. Uh, the one thing you might want here also is a governor. Because you don't want them pulling down a billion rows. Okay? That tends not to be much of a problem. But in today's world, you know, 
Well, then it's all million. That's what you can get into Excel. That solves most of the things people want to do. Okay. Oh my God. If the user is going to pull down this Y table, it's not going to work for them. It's going to be slow. Okay. Well, and this is what they're building in Access anyway. Make no mistake about it. And in Columnar land, does it make a difference? I've read a number of articles over the last six months that complain that users build power pivot models with one neutron star table. They don't call it a neutron star. You know, they say, oh, we need to teach our users to split out the dimensions to build the power pivot model. Explain to me why. I, you know, I really meant to do more extensive tests, but I did some tests on uh, AdventureWorks, which isn't really big enough. I can't see any difference between the two models. Once you get about a couple million records you care, a couple of billion records you care. I would not argue with that. Yeah, it's, more, it's really a memory issue more than, than a size issue. Yeah. Not great. Talking about jumps, but it's a basic level. You got TV is making jumps. Yeah, I mean, it, it, but it's better on, on your standard kind of queries. It doesn't make that much difference. Also, most. Not all, but most self-service environments are in the you know thousands to low millions. They're not in. They're definitely not in the millions. Okay. Uh, the other side of the coin is joints are expensive even in power pivot. They might not be as expensive, but they're still expensive. Um, and the speed of this subject matter source, this view is not as important as a query from a BI tool to your data warehouse. Because when I'm doing power view against my data warehouse, when I drag a new dimension on, it's got to be an analysis at the speed of thought. When I say on Monday morning, go get me last week's data, if I have to go get a cup of coffee, do I really care? Because then it's going to be local. And then I'll have my analysis at the speed of thought. Now again, this is for self-service. I am not saying this is a replacement for everything you're doing. Now, uh, in my final architecture diagram, I'll show you how this works out. But this is for self-service, not for your enterprise applications. There's one more piece of the pie I need to make the new architecture work. And that's something I call a landing zone. Okay, it's where the data from your source systems go. Not in ODS. It's not an enterprise data warehouse, but it becomes the system of record for all of your downstream processes, the way your EDW or your ODS works today. Okay, it's a permanent storage area from structured data sources. Okay, I don't think it makes sense to take unstructured data and put it into the landing zone this way. You use your data link for that. It traces change data capture from the source system so that you can recreate the data at any point in time. You can actually fall back and you can examine it. Okay? Your schema should emulate the source schema of your source. Let's try that again. Your schema, your, your schema for individual tables should be very close to the schema of the data source. Okay. We want that because when we go into get data from the source, we want to be as low touch as possible. We're going to get in and get out as quickly as possible. Something we tend not to do with data warehouses. That's why we do stationary things, right? Okay. One of the exceptions to this uh, matching sources, 
uh, particularly if you're getting data from multiple uh, platforms, you want to rationalize your data types. What does he mean by rationalizing your data types? <laughs> Anybody try to mix date data from Oracle or date data from SQL Server? You rationalize your data types, right? Okay, just making sure they're in the same format. Uh, it, it'd be like making sure that your uh, sort sequence on, on SQL Server instances are the same. Okay. So we had this landing zone thing. And then ta da! We end up with the post data warehouse self service architecture. So let's take a look at what we've got here. We have all our little sources. We have a hybrid data lake. We've got the landing zone, and we've got our Hadoop for the uh, unstructured data. We've got our master data management. Things don't change very much in that respect. People don't do the job. They really shouldn't be going there, in my opinion. But, but instead of going into a data warehouse, for it to even data marks, we have these subject matter sources, these views that users can access. So I can go, I want sales data, I want pricing data. I want sales data, I want HR data. Okay? And I can mix and match. You know, that that you know, this is the perfect power BI scenario, right? Okay. We do not make assumptions about what they want to do with data. This has been a world model for us at BI, right? We don't sit at the desk next to people doing the work. We expect to be able to walk to them and go, what do you want them, what do you want to do with this data? And we really expect them to be able to articulate it. So I like to say users don't mean to lie, but they do. <laughs> they can't articulate, it's not that they're lying, for fun, but they can't articulate what they're trying to do with the data in a way most of us can understand. Okay, the people that do BI best are the people that Hop over the fence or the other way around, right? You got to know both in today's environment. So we go into the subject matter sources. Again, the other problem is we don't have all the data they want. Some of it's in spreadsheets. Uh, uh, generally, any kind of target is in spreadsheet. It's not in the data warehouse. Any kind of syndicated data is in an access database. I've only had one client that ever put NPP data, for those of you who don't know what that is, like Nielsen data, into their data warehouse. Uh, now, here's the other side of the coin. Instead of building an enterprise data warehouse and trying to do everything for everybody all at once, we use the data lake as a source for enterprise apps. Should those enterprise apps have a dimensional model? A lot of them probably. Some of them not. We need to look at that on a contextual basis. Okay? If I'm building the enterprise performance management system that determines the 20% of the bonus that comes from you know, exceeding your MBOs, I probably want a dimensional model underneath there. If I'm building a system that does my week, uh, week, uh, monthly financial internal budget reporting through an SSRS environment, I probably want a dimensional model. If I'm building a pricing model to do dynamic pricing for uh, a job shop contracting, I probably don't. Okay? So you look at it on a contextual basis. That is my most fun slide. Here's things in the cube to make us get to talk. Kind of to be structured here. But I mean, let's take a look at what I've been talking about. You know, we we have we've invested a lot in our enterprise data warehouses. The landscape has shifted underneath us with self-service. And we're trying to hang on to that. And I question whether that's a good enough. Now, I'm not saying you all throw out our data warehouses and start all over again. But the data warehouse, your, your, your data environment is a dynamic one. As you start incorporating new things, as you start changing and upgrading, 
And as you look at your self-service environment, start thinking about this. Okay, if you're a mid-sized firm that really doesn't have an EDW, and you know, mid-sized in Microsoft's uh, jargon is up to a billion dollars. You know, I have a private company in, in Wisconsin that I'm working with. They're darn near a billion dollars. And right now, you know, it's just all access and Excel. And so they're trying to figure out what to do. And they're embracing this methodology because it fits with what was going on before. Okay? Uh, we're not, <clears throat> I'm not throwing the dimensional model off the cliff. But do remember, we did it because the software didn't work right. We didn't necessarily do it because it was a good idea. Okay? Um, the enterprise data warehouse, different story. I've never been a big fan. You know, I always thought anything that big was going to get that bogged back. Okay? And Teradata is the living proof of that. Uh, now, there are circumstances where that's really important. And I'm going to use one of Teradata's you know, four markets. If I'm trying to store call level, de call level detail in a telco, I need to do it that way. Okay, I need massively parallel data. Okay, that's structured data. Uh, but you know, that, that's an edge case. That's not the everyday case. Uh, you know, we blindly follow you know, I need to slowly change dimension and everything, whether the users want it or not. Yeah, anytime we say we know that a little longer, okay? They're the clients. Because they'll just sidestep us. You know, they get their job done regardless of how well we support them or not. Yes? Aren't you making a big assumption that the business people actually have enough numbers in data to actually get the right Answer that they're uh, or analysis that they're trying to put together. I mean, they know that they know. They, know. they and I'm agreeing with that. They don't know data. They know they know, they, they know the lookup though. Yeah. <laughs> the most confused function in the history of programming. <laughs> no, but, they, they, you know, but, but that's what I'm saying is we're not giving them something complicated. We're giving them a very targeted uh, thing. It's their data, of course they know. Okay. Well, that's not necessarily true, but you know, it's sort of like, but it is their job, and if they don't know it, they should get a different job. Well, if they don't know it, then we gave it to them in a way that they can't understand. Well, okay, there's a different thing here. So, I, again, you can make the distinction between self-service. We're, what we're arguing here is whether self-service is a good idea, not whether this is a good way to, to uh, infrastructure self-service. Okay, whether self-service. Okay, I'll give you a great example where it's not. They're out of business now, which might be an example of this. Uh, uh, Hollywood Video did a system for Hollywood Video. They didn't want any self-service. These people that manage those stores. They only finished high school. They never went to college or else they actually had a good job. Okay? Uh, they didn't want these guys to have them self service. We had a, a knock down. You couldn't use the pivot tables. Pivot tables gave them too much power. I mean, that's going to what you said. Okay? And that's the way any corporation is going to be. They're going to be, MDA is going to be in there looking at how do I maximize my profit, minimize my expenses. And that usually relates to higher high school dropouts. Well, it, okay, so let's, let's talk about this one because <laughs> this is one of my big arguments uh, uh, with the way Microsoft positions on this. Microsoft positions the whole BI side, and most other companies do too, toward the information worker. Okay? Line people are not information workers. The manager of Hollywood Video. Even the engineer in a production facility is not, even though they're very highly educated, very analytically uh, aware, but they are not an information worker. That is not their job. Not can they do it, not are they qualified. It's not their job. Their job is to keep the production line going. Okay? 
How many times have you been in a situation where you saw that they took that line worker and promoted them into the data guy, the information worker? Right, but we're making the argument about where self-service is appropriate and where it's not. And I'm not going to argue. There are many, many cases that self-service is not an appropriate vehicle. I actually think we overdo it. If really when we're doing self-service, we're making any IT departments in our analytical groups. But you know, I'm not sure that's a bad idea. Uh, uh, but that where self-service is appropriate, and not appropriate, is a different discussion and something I'm I'm not going to. So anyway, I'm not going to mark time. Not bad. So uh, questions? Do you want to throw things at me? Can I just blow through bubbles? Ooh, that's precious. Uh, I promise to hold me the hand back to me. Can you talk a little bit about how you go about implementing this methodology? Say I bought into it, I want to do it tomorrow. Pieces. I mean, I'm a So you always do things in pieces. And I've carved it out by subject there. Take a set. And for the first one, you know, I, I, an easy problem. You have to show a lot to learn about it. You know, what, and, and, you know, building any system is not just a matter of technology. It's not just a matter of people. It's not just a matter of skill sets. Uh, it's a matter of culture. Right. Okay, so you want to do it incrementally by subject here. And, and do something that's a new rather than, you know, conversion has to have a value here, right? New doesn't have to have as much value, right? If you're green with the Another question? Each subject area has just one uh, nucleus bomb database. Neutron bomb star, yeah. Yes. Neutron star data set. 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 Wow. Why are you shaking your head? Uh, just, I've been delivering solutions to companies for a long time, where we're not, we're not taking that step to. Uh, no one does. This is radical. I know, but, but but there's the other way of delivering stuff that allows them to build off of what they want to do, and a lot of folks do know their data pretty well. But again, this is a you know, it's a, a technology thing, and I come from the SAP world, so well, it's not a Microsoft. It, it, okay, we do need to make a distinction when we say users know their data. There's, there's two meanings to that. They always know their data in a way we have. Okay, they can look at product number QZ74 and know that you know that's a warm dress or some color. Okay, they know their data. And they always know it better than we do. Do they know? Data modeling is a different question. And there are users that know data modeling, and there's generally within each group one that one person that does it all, right? <laughs> and then, you know, that they're the you know person everybody goes to for data. But if that's what we're doing, we're not doing self-service. Uh, I guess it's just the semantics, uh, and, uh, and again, where what world do you come from? But uh, the other thing that that I noticed um, that having some experience with some of the high speed uh, in memory processing is that data modeling becomes a totally different thing in an in memory environment where you have everything in memory. A data model can change in a nanosecond, and you can implement a new model, you know, as fast as you can think of what other changes that you'd like. Not to in see. Microsoft, you have to reload your data. <laughs> Um, again, uh, sorry, I don't work in the no, no, Maybe it, I know why again, now. It, 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 again, saying in memory is different than saying columnar. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, and most of the, you know, the most, I mean, columnar and in memory are basically working together. You know, you can still do, case. you can do row stuff in, in memory, right. but you're not going to see the benefits right. of what true in memory is going to be. Again, and they'll tell you that right up front. So you do spend a lot of time transitioning you know, tables to columnar when you bring that stuff over because it just makes more sense. And like, well, it's a, it, it, it's a different, you know, it, only on the surface does columnar look like relational. It has a whole different performance personality, for lack of a better word. 
smaller book print and all kinds of good things. Yeah. I'll come back. Yeah. Um, so a conceptual question. So is it, in some sense, fair to say that you replace an EGW with your uh, data label landing zone yeah. and replace the data marks that were getting data from an EGW with your subject yeah. matter sources? Is that, is that one way of looking at your architecture? Yeah, it kind of. I mean, there, there, there's some uh, 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 execution differences. Right. You know, uh, we make a lot of, you know, we instantiate a lot of data. We really do. Now, storage is cheap, but ETL is not. We spend a tremendous amount of money and energy and bits on ETL. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think a lot of it is just, you know, um, I, I have a friend that says every CIO, and that 80% of the CIOs in America should be renamed chief players with toys. <laughs> um, and, you know, how much did I ask to play with toys? Yeah. And then, uh, so that was conceptual. On the technology side, are you suggesting let's use a new visual landing zone uh, or a new related technologies and for your uh, uh, subject? Uh, what are they called? Subject matter sources. Okay, so this is not resonating. <laughs> I a new name. SMS, right? SMS. Okay. For SMS, you use what? Like, you still Well, SMS it. is, you know, uh, uh, it's a, a logical construct. Okay, so uh, in a perfect world with infinite resources, it would just be a view. Okay? Now, in real life, does that always work? No. Might we need to instantiate portions of it, either as a data mark or uh, you know, as a cube? Yes. Now, I do want to address your, uh, should Hadoop be the landing song? Because I actually meant to address that on the slide. Now I go to that one slide. So, um, how much time do I have? Well, why, why, don't we, why don't we do this? You can respond to that, and then we'll have uh, the question in the rear. There's a woman over there that I always call about every two. Okay, and we'll have those two questions, and then we'll adjourn for the evening, but I'll be around here. I'll be around here. I'll be around here. Okay. They never heard the types of control I wanted to address uh, should Hadoop be the whole landing? There's, uh, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are doing modern data warehouse. I'm totally a data warehouse uh, And just do it in Hindu. I do not think that is a viable solution today. Talk to me in two years, I might have an entirely different opinion. How much MapReduce do you want to write? Okay, we do not have the tools, and I do not care. Every day I get another press release from someone that magically makes it happen. I don't believe this. Uh, the tools are getting better, They're getting better very quickly. Okay, they are not there yet. In today's world, right now, I recommend structured data into structured landing zone, unstructured data into unstructured. Does not make sense to take the unstructured data and try to make it structured before we know the problem set we're trying to execute on. And in today's world, it does not make it just to use unstructured data. What is the very first thing that I do? I make it structured. So we're not taking structured data and making it unstructured so that I can then structure it again. That's make it make work. Jen, what's your question? <coughs> I'm just, I'm still trying to get my head around this whole who is a self-service user sort of thing because I, I have this image of, well, it's actually someone sort of like me because I do some data analysis and for me, you know, having a big old table that has all the stuff I need in one sounds great. But we have, say, take a very specific example, like a product manager of a website who wants a bunch of data analysis. Today. They have lots of things they're interested in, lots of things they want. But it's a little more complicated than just giving them a weekly report that we got in this. Because we can't keep up. Because because we can't keep up. So that's where so what we're doing right now is we're using cubes and we're letting them do hit the table. <coughs> and it's working pretty well. And I'm kind of curious where you put that on the on spectrum. Well again, you know, it really goes to where do we draw the line of what is an enterprise app 
and what is self-service. It's a very fuzzy line, right? And, and I don't think you look at a person and say, you're a self-service user. I don't trust you at all. You only get reports, buddy. <laughs> uh, 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 they might both be the same person. Because when I get my monthly financials out of the accounting system, that should not be self-service. When I report to the federal government, that should not be self-service. Um, you know, anything that keeps the executives out of jail should not be self-service. Uh, and there's more and more of that every day. But I mean, it, it's how well you can keep up with user requests. It's really intelligent cap. It also goes to the that sophistication of your users. I think we have an editorial comment. Yeah, I was just going to mention, I'm essentially maintaining one of those subject matter sources. I pulled the data directly from IT. I provide it to it. That's the users on the business side. But what I wanted to add as a caveat is that 20% of my training was teaching them how to use the dashboards I built and, and play with the numbers. 80% of the training has been providing a caveat on the data I'm saying. Like, this data is good, except you have to be aware that these aren't correlated with that. That's never been entered correctly, and you can't trust it for squat. It's all of the information about the data itself and its quality as it comes from the warehouse. Yeah. What did I say? Everybody ignores master data management. And that's really what you're talking about. We had better master data management. It was more discoverable, better than discoverable. If it went along with the data, these are preliminary numbers versus the final closed numbers. You don't know how often I've had that in a financial system. Uh, but you know, uh, whether you're self-service or an enterprise app, that doesn't change. Okay. Final question back here. Yeah. It, it goes to how do you restrict access to fields in your subject matter or source? I, mean, I can understand you can have a huge table. But if I don't want someone to get a revenue deal, how do I, where is yeah, that? Well, I mean, you know, all of these systems have security. I don't think your security room will change. That's a view. I can put security on the view. But where's the tool that accesses the, which specific tool am I using? Well, I, you know, these days I'm using reporting services. Reporting services constructs the subject matter sources. Okay, and then it, allows me to build a UI with selection criteria and a governor really quick. Not the nicest UI in the world, but it's incredibly functional. So, so it's not in the data, it's in the app. Well, no, the security is in the data. Okay. Because, you know, there's a, in SQL Server, I create a schema, a, schema, a certain schema, has the sales queries in it, and I do my security on those. I think Mark's cutting me off here. Um, this is not the hook. This is thank you very much, Dan, for coming out tonight. And thank you to everyone for uh, taking the time to make it tonight. Happy New Year, and we'll see you at a, a future meeting.